Hello and welcome to the Feminist Talks. This podcast is brought to you by the volunteers from the Feminist Group at Mellenfolkelit Samvirke in Aarhus. In this podcast series, we will discuss different aspects of feminism, topics related to it, and why is this movement still relevant in our society. Today's topic is about feminism in religion and religious minorities in Denmark. I am Kirsi and with me in the studio is Haya and Nadine. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Before we start, could you shortly introduce yourselves? Okay. Uh, my name is Nadine. I am 23 years old, uh, currently studying a master's in intercultural studies, and I am Danish Palestinian. My name is Haya. I am 27 years old and I currently work in an architectural office here in Denmark. I am from Syria myself and yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to move on, how would you define feminism and would you call yourself one? That's a dear question for me because if you ask me in the normal aspect of when people usually ask me, are you a feminist? I, I take like a very strong stance against it and say, no, I'm not. Because I can't relate to the current um, feminist ideals, but in my own head and in my own kind of definition of feminism, I'm absolutely a, a feminist, I would say. I guess uh, for me, I do define myself as a feminist. I would say that for me, feminism is the movement that uh, accepts all women, wants women to be uh, treated the way they are. Like despite what they dress, where they come from, and I have a huge. Uh, I really like the movement itself, and it represents me. It's the reason I became the person I am today. It's because of feminism. So I do define as one, and yeah. Now we could turn to the next question, um, and I would like to turn the eyes now to the religion, as today's topic is more about religion and how it relates to feminism. And um, I must start out by saying I am not part of any religion uh, myself and I haven't considered becoming a member of, of a religious community. But would you identify yourselves as religious and do you affiliate with a certain religion? I define myself as an agnostic. Uh, I'm more close to Islam as my in my daily life, I would say, because I grew up with it uh, as I come from Syria and in a from not so religious family, but it's a big part of my culture. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's uh, my identification of myself. Hmm. Um, I identify as Muslim. Uh, I come from a, a Muslim family, uh, but I've had to go through like my very own journey of finding out how I identify as a Muslim and how I implement, it, implement Islam in my daily life. Um, uh, but yeah, like the very fundament of who I am as a person is my, my religion for sure. And would you say, what would be the religious practices that you do? And, um, and would it, and is it easy to find places for that here in Denmark? I mean, for example, I pray five times a day. That's my, uh, my daily meditation, um, and I'm having a very difficult time finding like access to places where I can pray. So, for example, at my university, um, there aren't any like uh, dedicated rooms for for meditation or for prayers. But I know that in other universities in other cities, they have um, rooms that are dedicated to that. So, I really have to f find my way around the the system, I guess of finding places to pray. Sometimes I find an empty stairwell and I pray there. Um, but to me, it's something that I need to do because that grounds me and that makes sure that I can continue with my day without feeling anxious or, or just, just gives me peace. Um, and then there is the whole question of, you know, wearing the headscarf and how does that limit accessibility in Denmark, uh, which is a very 
broad and, and deep talk uh, and some reflections that I had to have before I chose to wear the headscarf like a year ago. So you started wearing it a, a year ago. Yeah, in February, it was exactly a year ago where I, I decided to start wearing it um, because that's what I wanted. And uh, it really does relate to the topic of feminism because it was also my way of defying the, the perception of what is a strong woman and defying the ideals of a woman who chooses to wear a headscarf is a woman that is oppressed. Um, so I, I, I'm a feminist activist in my daily life just by the person that I am and how I carry myself and the choices I make in terms of my career and my personal life. Um, and that is represented by me wearing a scarf showing that I'm a Muslim feminist because I'm defying all of the ideals of how I should be um, and making a choice for women like me. Um, breaking away from the stereotypes and the, and the ideals that I can't relate to. Yeah. Amazing. Haya, do you, do you have some, even though you are an agnostic, do mm -hmm. you have some sort of uh, religious practices or some, some um, just activities that you, that you do? Well, mainly I still keep some things, such as like Ramadan currently. I do the fasting. And I guess that's a part, the month itself is a very special month for myself. And I could say that it's, uh, it's not like it's extremely hard to do it here in Denmark, but uh, there is lots of judgment from people when they look at me, knowing that I am an, an, I'm not religious myself, but still I am not drinking water or eating, even eating pork, for example. Uh, I don't do that. So there is a lot of pressure. Like, how could you do this to yourself? Or why would you not drink? Like, that's not normal. Or pressuring me into like, oh, you. C but you are not religious, so why don't you eat pork? It, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's just my choice. And even, I, I think that's, that's a huge pressure. Uh, especially here in Denmark, uh, as I see from my workplace, eating, for example, pork is a, is a must. <laughs> and I'm still like, and, and for me, it's just like, but why? It's like, you know, it's like choosing not to eat meat in general, or <laughs> let's say I don't like it. And I'm a person who doesn't like tomatoes, who cares? But when it comes, for example, to pork, everyone cares. When it comes to something that is related to Islam, then everyone is like, no, 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 no. You're <laughs> oppressed by your religion. But I'm not religious, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a weird double standard. I mean, like, I think that even vegans and uh, vegetarians have it easier time, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, because we are against slaughtering animals. But I mean, like, it doesn't have to be the only reason why you don't <laughs> want to eat this. It's, uh, yeah, it's. But let me tell you, point. being Arab and being vegetarian is a very tough thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So like I've been vegetarian for three years and to this day, my mom still tries to convince me to eat uh, meat. Just this one, just yeah. this one. So like it's a, uh, it's the flip side of the same coin, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Nadine, Nadine, are you also uh, doing Ramadan? Um, I'm partaking in it. I'm not fasting due to like health reasons, um, but it's, to me, it's the focus on spirituality and, uh, and working to become a better person person not just for for other people but for myself um so i always try to advocate that R ramadan isn't just for the abstaining from food or from sexual activity or stuff like that but it's also just taking the time to reflect upon who you are as a person and who you want to be as a person so in that case yes i do partake <laughs> and it's a very like a family oriented month so that's why I go home and we eat uh, the entire family together and just spend a lot of family time and nurture that relationship. Um, so, yeah, it's a very special month as well for yeah. us. Hmm. We talked a little bit about um, your decision also to, to wear a headscarf mm -hmm. and that it was also like actually a political decision as mm -hmm. well to uh, represent uh, a feminist Muslim woman. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and to spin that off, um, it, there is a lot of controversy here in Europe uh, mm -hmm. about the clothing of Muslim women. And, um, and unfortunately, it is often relayed in mainstream media that uh, Muslim women are oppressed by Islam mm -hmm. and cannot choose what they wear. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And also they have, there is a couple of examples to give. Um, Two years ago or so, there was an election period here in Denmark where the far-right political party put up posters such as uh, <laughs> Turklædet og meld dig ind i Denmark, mm-hmm. which means take off your headscarf or hijab and become Danish mm-hmm. or like become part of our Dan- great Danish nation. <laughs> and, um, and of course, there are other examples like the burkini ban in mm-hmm. the French beaches um, f- five, six years ago. And uh, of course, in general, the burqa ban in, mm-hmm. uh, in many countries in EU. I mean, there is... It's quite a long list mm-hmm. of of how to how to limit uh, actually your choice of what mm-hmm. you wear. Uh, so I would like to ask your thoughts on this lasting bias, and do you have some personal experiences you would like to share? I mean, as a as a Danish Palestinian Muslim girl, like the reflections I had in terms of whether I should wear the scarf or not were. N- not at all connected to like my my appearance in itself but more so being aware that the choice that i make by wearing the headscarf also means i have less accessibility it also means i have to send out 60 percent more applications to find a job mm-hmm. in, in like currently in denmark um but as you said it was very uh to me it's also like a very political statement because again it relates to how i define feminism And how I define feminism is that every single woman should have the right to decide and have um, agency over her own body. Mm. That that is regardless of whether she wants to be covered up and dressed modestly or if she wants to free the nipple. I mean, no one, no one gets to have a say in that. But we often only see um, the fighting for one side of women should be free to wear as little as they want. And of course, they should be free to do that but women should also be free to be able to wear as much as they want so to me it was also like a going against the the stereotypes surrounding muslim women about them being um house moms or being oppressed and being unsuccessful i guess and i'm just i'm wearing the headscarf and i'm an intelligent woman and i'm uh successful in what i want to do And I'm doing that even though you think that I am not capable of that. And I'm doing it while wearing a headscarf and I'm doing it while all of the odds are against me. So I'm trying to break the stereotype of how a Muslim woman should be. And I'm fighting for all Muslim women and all women in general to have agency over their own bodies and their own decisions. Um, So it's political in that sense, but it's also a decision that has repercussions. And I am aware of that, but I'm willing to... To, f- to fight for that so my future children and my future nieces can wear as much or as little as they want without having to go through the same process that I have to. Yeah. Haya, do you have a comment on that? I would say that on your question, uh, on Nadine's, I agree with Nadine, of course, on what she says. I agree that uh, currently most of the feminists uh, are... Uh, putting all women in one frame where they need to wear something specific and that is not fair. That's not what feminism is about. Feminism is about women's right and a woman have the right to wear or not wear whatever she wants. Uh, it's a very shame what uh, most of the countries are doing regarding the Muslim woman, especially let's say if a woman take a choice to put the hijab, then that means she made a choice that she wants to dress in a certain way. So why banning her from swimming just because she puts something on her body that is that looks different than a bikini or going naked in the sea? There is uh, other example. If people get drunk on the beach and then just jump into the water, no one cares. They're fully dressed. There is no fine for that. But if a woman wears a burkini, then oh my God, we need to, we need to stop that. Mm-hmm. So that is... Uh, I would say that there is a huge fight and there is a a huge effort needs to be put to defend women's choices, Muslim women's choices, because I can see until now that when a feminist come out to speak or to say something, they would be like, oh, the hijab is oppressing you. You you don't want that. Well, you don't know what what I want. Mm -hmm. That's not for anyone to say. So... I agree with Nadine and I'm very sorry about what's uh, 
like what I'm hearing and I'm mm. uh, it's it's a shame how feminism is being turned into a very biased mm. movement but I I I would say I strongly believe in the movement itself in the core of the movement mm. that it's uh, for all women despite whatever they wear how they look like or where they come from western or eastern mm-hmm Absolutely agree. I mean, a lot of feminism is, you know, has been whitewashed, especially in the early mm. days. You know, when we look back at the suffragist movement in the beginning of 20th century, how it was really also about the privileged white. Mm. We still see the remnants of that nowadays. Mm. Mm-hmm. And also when this uh, burkini ban happened in France, I mean, there really weren't white feminists, you know, speaking out for the matter. I mm-hmm. mean, there were very, very few. So I completely agree. We yeah. are fighting for feminist rights for women to wear what mm. they want and then when it comes to muslim women nobody bothers to ask them no mm. <laughs> like exactly what, what they want to wear yeah. you know it's uh it's i think a very nearsighted and hypocritical yeah but also just contemporary feminism as it is right now is oppressive in and of itself and it's very selective in terms of who do we choose to support and whose voices are we actually taking away in all of that process so you're belittling women by saying that Oh, you're oppressed and you don't have agency over your own body by choosing to wear the headscarf. So I choose to wear the headscarf because I wanted to, not because uh, a man told me to. And the same way my sister chooses not to wear a headscarf because that's her choice. Um, but I feel like as soon as a woman chooses to do something that goes against like the Western ideals of how a woman should be, then she's automatically less than and less intelligent and she's oppressed because she's not capable of making her own decisions. So how do we turn around and understand feminism in a different way than the current discourse shows feminism? Because the current feminist discourse is, is as I said, extremely um, biased, it's privileged, and it's also very selective, uh, which, in, which is a <clears throat> an issue and goes completely against the feminist values in and mm-hmm. of itself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I um, I myself, I like to wear scarves around my mm-hmm. head. I'm, uh, as I said, I'm not religiously affiliated, but I just like to wear scarves mm-hmm. around my head because it is nice <laughs> against the wind. And I mean, uh, I mean, I just find them very beautiful. And it has, it's it's like when I came to Denmark, I remember one very specific time. I, I put it on. It was very windy, and um, there was a car passing by, and then a guy rolled down the window to yell after me, like, mm-hmm. take it off mm-hmm. or, or something in that style. Uh, and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, uh, like, and, and then in other, in other context, it's the same. Uh, it, it's just, I, I, for, for my mind, I, I don't understand the big issue around it. And mm-hmm. I mean, I also come, I come from Estonia and I, I, uh, I come from a place which is also, yeah, they, uh, they are not very welcoming of people. Uh, <laughs> let's just put it this way. All people. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, uh, I mean, there I didn't have, I didn't experience that because mm-hmm. I also wore my headscarf there. But here in Denmark, it has happened a couple of times mm-hmm. that, uh, that I got this strong reaction. Uh, do, have, you, have you had any reactions uh, against that, like so openly, uh, Nadine? I mean... When I chose to wear the headscarf last February, it was just the start of COVID. So <laughs> to be honest, I haven't been much out in public um, in general. I uh, When it was like my one year anniversary for wearing the headscarf, I did like a, a post on LinkedIn. And I think that was the first time that I got some, some, some stereotypes thrown my way to my face. Uh, um, <clears throat> people claiming that I was oppressed, even though I was using my voice to tell people, no, I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> this is my choice. Um, whilst people wanted to press oppression on me and, and tell me, no, you have been oppressed. Um, but in terms of like friends and family that have worn the headscarf for longer, they have absolutely uh, experienced direct racial uh, assaults. Um, my mom and my closest friends, um, my friend here in Aarhus, has experienced someone st- saying straight to her face, take that blanket off of your head and, or go back to your home country, even though she's born and raised here. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I've been one of the lucky ones who haven't experienced uh, racially mov- motivated assaults or religiously motivated assaults. Um, but unfortunately, I am mentally prepared 
for that to happen. And I am very acutely aware of my surroundings ever since I chose to wear the headscarf. And that is partially my own bias against people's reactions, but it's also a reality of having to be prepared for that in, in today's current climate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Currently in Denmark, they are, they are, they want to throw out uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, and, uh, one here. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 Haya, what's your take on that? My take on that, I am very <laughs> disappointed as uh, a human first, as I actually myself when the revolution broke in Syria, I have moved quite a lot. I moved like three countries before until I settled or thought. I settle here in Denmark. And then with the recent uh, things that's happening, I'm more and more sure that I'm actually very disappointed because I look at the people around me, Danish people around me, and I can see they're uh, being empathetic with what's happening. But when I look at the government in here, it's just extremely sad. What's happening is just not humane anymore. And it gets me to think on a certain, on a certain way that why, why is it, is it because I'm from the Middle East? Is it because they just have this Islamophobic culture that they want to just say, if you are from Syria, you have to go back to your country because it didn't happen before with like, with any, with anyone, with any refugees. And the reason it's happening now is it's bring. it's like, for me, even, I would say that I am thinking of leaving the country. I'm not myself very affected by those uh, new policies because I'm a political refugee in here. Mm -hmm. So legally, I cannot be sent back as long as the Assad is there. But with all that hatred, I feel that I'm unwelcome. I feel that I am just, uh, I'm not a human anymore. I've been stripping from all my rights. I fought and I came through, I came through, like, I went through death to come here, came on a rubber boat. I could have died any minute. So I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> and I would say that uh, it's uh, from feminism to refugees to all Denmark have failed as a government. I still believe in the people. I still believe in the young people who are going to come, but I just don't know when these things are going to change. And I don't know if I have the patience for things to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can totally relate to that. I was appalled when I heard that now Syria is safe. Let's send everybody <laughs> back. And I yes. mean, they have also gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of press from international politicians it's not just also people here uh, in Denmark because there are massive demonstrations and there was just yeah. a very big one taking place here in Aarhus last yeah. week in, on Wednesday. Uh, and, and I mean, this is not the only place. The whole, the whole Europe is pretty appalled mm -hmm. of how Denmark just wants to yeah. get rid of, uh, get rid of uh, Syrians and uh, is so openly racist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, we yes. can't just wait around. Mm -hmm. Yes. Aya, could you tell us more about the demonstration in Aarhus and in Copenhagen that yes. took place? So the demonstration in Aarhus have been actually announced after the one in Copenhagen, and that was be uh, with solidarity with it. And that's because lots of people couldn't make it to Copenhagen. So we figured we should have one in Aarhus. And just four days before the uh, date of the demonstration, we announced it on Facebook, released it on Facebook, and... Just in two days, it got 1,000 people interested and I don't know, like 400 going. On the time of the demonstration, we could see that actually there was a lot of people coming and there was all kinds of people. There was the Syrian refugees, there was some, uh, there was some Danish people, there was, like, there was a lot of internationals and it was so, it was like very uh, heartwarming to see as m myself as well, like as, as a Syrian refugee looking there and seeing it gave me a lot of hope. And then uh, the media came and we didn't call any media. We didn't call any channel. It was by themselves. They, they had the press cards and they were taking pictures and doing some interviews with some people. 
And we stood there with some, with uh, some people said some words for like 30 to 45 minutes. And the one in Copenhagen had around 5,000 people. So more and more. So the next day we were all just, you know, I was, I was checking the news and being like, I want to see, I want to see what they wrote about it. I, I was very excited that people are going to know more about it. And then suddenly we wait. It's the first day, the second day, there's no news about this demonstration. What happened? Usually when there is a small demonstration for men in black, the pe- like uh, the, uh, the people who don't agree, like who see that Corona is not there, there is news all over saying there was a demonstration in Aarhus. There was, uh, I don't know, a firework in Aarhus. There is a bird flying in Aarhus. <laughs> but <laughs> 400 people standing in front of the municipality house didn't make it into the news. I'm just asking. We tried. We tried to contact TV2 specifically, <laughs> because uh, I, I didn't try to contact them. It was a woman and she actually posted her like uh, email and uh, answers with them. And their answer was like, oh, there is of other news standing in line before that demonstration to be announced. 400 people standing in, in front of the <laughs> municipality house all together in solidarity is not a big news enough for for the Danish news. But 20 people going outside saying <laughs> we don't want to put face masks on is good. I actually read lots of, uh, I wouldn't say silly <laughs> news. I don't want to say that. <laughs> but lots of just normal news every day. And that actually how I knew that even the media in here is kind of politically biased i don't know mm-hmm. how what well, i don't know the word in english for that actually when the media is not anymore covering the news for people they're just mm-hmm. covering specific news just the ones that says look at those refugees they are criminals look at those refugees they are bad examples this is a good news for danish yeah absolutely. media mm-hmm. absolutely i mean the media when they also portray uh, mostly men or women. I mean, they only talk about the bad things. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so they never talk about like uh, like good stories or how, how they really are as people. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, uh, Nadine, do you have some examples? I mean, it's always either the the troublemakers or the ones who distance themselves from religion. It's never those who who manage to be both Danish and Muslim at the same time. You never hear about those. Um, like uh, just two minutes ago, I read an art- article about Zac Efron's face. Imagine that that got that got media coverage instead of um, talking about the real issues. I think the media isn't a- aiming for change. The media is just playing into existing stereotypes and bias and and lack of representation instead of trying to evolve. And that's a huge issue because a lot of the the racism and the stereotyping and the bias that we deal with today is is very much due to the media. Because something I always say and something my mom taught me is the way to fight stereotype and bias is through contact. Mm-hmm. So imagine people not having contact to Muslims or Syrians or whoever it may be, or all of the information they have they're getting from the media. And the media is so incredibly biased and really lacks representation. So obviously we're just going to feed into that uh, existing bias and stereotypes. And and so the media plays a huge role and has a huge responsibility, but they're really not, I feel like they're, they're the, the social responsibility that they have, uh, they're not living up to it. Mm-hmm. No, they only live up to, uh, someone's interpretation Mm -hmm. of the world Mm -hmm. and they are feeding into that Mm -hmm. which i Mm -hmm. think also is extremely extremely harmful Mm -hmm. and causes this racism to be where it is at the moment Mm -hmm. just because we hear only the negative yes Mm -hmm. and it's really shame because it's happening in a country like denmark Mm -hmm. that's that's always what i'm gonna drill back to this is denmark this is the place where like where's the danish culture the qualities that everyone is talking about, openness, equality, solidarity. Where is all of that when I look at the government or the media? It doesn't relate at all. Mm-hmm. No. Uh-uh. 
I mean, it's just the image that they create. Yes. But it's not the reality, mm. no. unfortunately. No. That's the, the brand of Denmark, but unfortunately, as you said, it's not the reality. Mm. And why haven't we heard more about MS? Why don't we hear more about other organizations that fight for, for equal rights? Why are we only hearing about the, the flip side? Like, why, we, why are we not being... Why are we not providing more representation in terms of of Absolutely who agree. we we give media coverage? But uh, that brings yeah. me to the next point that we talked about the white feminism and and how this is still very very strong in its uh, in its presence in mm-hmm. uh, so called feminism because you know they just take it as a granted uh, or take it as a as a normal we are we are we are white so therefore you know we just mm-hmm. call this feminism we don't we don't we don't start putting any other labels on us but uh, but then in terms of muslim women being represented in the media mm-hmm. um, to my eyes it very often seems that there is always somebody else speaking out on their behalf <laughs> kind of like uh, you know playing the white knight oh mm-hmm. i'm gonna for example i'm gonna i'm gonna save the muslim women for the hijabs <laughs> you know and all this oppress- oppressive culture and um, and you know this is pretty um, I, i find it <laughs> so wrong <laughs> that uh, that muslim women themselves are not allowed to get screen time or yeah. radio time to speak out on their own behalf because it's basically like mm-hmm. i feel like a lot of mansplaining is going mm-hmm. on or, that, or, or just people speaking on behalf of people they do not even understand mm-hmm. or they don't even understand what they want um so i would like to ask you about about either uh, either bigger feminist activists or feminist uh, feminists in your own life mm-hmm. that have uh, that have influenced you or mm. inspired you I would say for me it's a special kind of feminist or she calls herself a feminist uh, she was from the middle east and she was like uh, public on facebook uh, fighting saying that i'm a feminist and i'm here to fight for her uh, women rights and she was from the middle east herself but she lives in sweden and she really kind of when i was listening to her i would say, i would like She would be like, girls in the Middle East are oppressed by their culture. I was, I am from the Middle East. I know uh, you are only putting your hijab because of your family. I, I, my family oppressed me to put my hijab. I know that you are the same. You should take off, you should take off your hijab and all these kind of things. And it's time to, for you to rebel and all, all those uh, kind of just be yourself and and on and on and on and it just that got me to think i'm just like what if that woman that person chose that religion by herself and she chose to put hijab is part of the religion that means if she chose that religion she chose a hijab that's it what what about her did you do you actually know that she's oppressed like why no one is asking those women mm. and that it got me to think i'm just like Really? Is that what feminism is about? And I got to read about it. And then I was like, that's not what feminism is about. So she actually effect, like, you know, inspired me to be the exact opposite of what she is. Hmm. To fight for actual women rights. To fight for w- women right to wear what they want. To be who they want. Uh, to, not, to not be afraid to wear the hijab. To not think twice before wearing it or taking it off even. Because if a woman as well in the Middle East tries to take it off, there would be a, lots of, I would say in the Middle East mostly, there would be lots of, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that mm-hmm. or something like that. Women women should have the right of doing whatever they want. So mm. that's how she inspired me. <laughs> I don't know how you call it. <laughs> yeah. So kind of a role model. Okay. Yes. <laughs> a reverse role model. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. That's like... A, Every time I see those feminists, I'm like, oh, dear Lord, <laughs> one, one more, one more. But at, at least, you know, she is gonna. Uh, the way that she inspired me, I hope, is gonna inspire other girls to be the same as mm-hmm. like reading into actual feminism and digging deep into the movement and how it actually happened rather than just looking on what's happening now and be like, oh, because actually that's driving other Muslim women away from feminism. They look at feminism as something that oppresses, like, you know, oppresses them, actually. That's mm-hmm. something that doesn't fit them. We are losing lots of women and girls and young girls by doing these kind of 
things and ju- prejudgment about how a strong woman should look like. Mm-hmm. A strong woman is a person that could wear or not wear whatever she wants. Mm-hmm. She's just she's just not afraid. She's, she knows she's supported by her other fellow women, despite mm-hmm. whatever she chose. Absolutely agree. I mean, I think the the best or like the only feminism for me is intersectional. Mm-hmm. I mean, it ha- it shouldn't have any specifications of what is okay and what is not. It's it's in general about a, a human right yeah, to exactly. choose. <laughs> uh, Nadine, do you have any comment on this question? I mean, I completely agree with Haya. Absolutely, and I think in terms of like media representation. Um, it's nearly non-existent. I mean, if you see a Muslim woman in in movies or TV series, it's because she's going to be liberated by the white boy who's going to uh, save her from her oppressive family and and allow her to take off her scarf and and experience and research sexuality and whatever it may be. But I've have never watched something and it's even been like, you know what? That's me. That's me being represented. So in terms of public figures, uh, I haven't seen many uh who are directly feminist activists i guess for me it's more so the 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 women in my life uh that are without them even being aware of it being uh feminists and feminist activists so take my mom for example she's a muslim woman who chooses to wear the headscarf despite living in denmark but at the same time she fights for her right to uh, to break away from both Middle Eastern norms, but also uh, European norms. So she's a working woman. She's a strong, independent woman. Uh, she fights for the right of her daughters and her grandchildren. Um, she pushes us to be the best version uh, of ourselves, to take an education, to be successful, independent women, uh, and pushes us to be able to take independent decisions, such as me choosing to wear the headscarf um, and defying all of the, the ideals of how we strong women should be in in the Danish or the European context and defying that and showing that there are that the feminist movement in and of itself, as Haya said, is is oppressive uh, because it doesn't consider the the ideals of of the different ideals of how or which rights a woman should have. Um, so unfortunately I I when I was younger, I really lacked representation in the media of of young women that looked like me. Um, so I guess that's that responsibility lies on me and my generation because we are privileged uh, and we can speak up. But that doesn't mean we can take away from other women's uh, voices. Yeah, mm. absolutely agree. So, so what changes would you actually like to see in the Danish society? here where we all live i think like as that example you mentioned when there was those advertisement about take off your hijab and blend in or be a danish mm. there should be a serious consequences like laws to be put like yes i understand there is the freedom of speech and the freedom of every person to express their ideas and so on but a person freedom stops when it actually starts to interfere with another person freedom those muslim the muslim community itself they also are free to practice or do whatever they want a woman could be not religious and wear the headscarf herself as you as you for example were doing when you see something in the street when i would say that a person let's say if i chose to wear the headscarf and i see in the street well take off your headscarf and become a danish what is that like what 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 is that like hmm. what in which world this is happening this is not the 21st century this is not at all hmm. what we what our ancestors worked for this is just very sad however so th- there should be like a serious consequences and laws that prevent such activities i would say there should be more awareness and more in the schools like in the house the young generation should learn more uh, in the schools about religion itself or just respecting other people's freedom despite their religion. You shouldn't, like a person in the schools, they shouldn't look at people as, oh, she's a Muslim or he's a Muslim, oppressed. They're Christian, 
they're oppressed. I don't know what. There should be more awareness. I think there's uh, lots of uh, things are lacking in this system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you said, I mean, it's basically, oh, there is only one way to be Danish. So, mm -hmm. you know, take off your headscarf. That's, that's, even that is not enough sometimes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nadine? I guess I strive for uh, a perfect day where uh, a woman's choice to wear whatever she wants to wear is not discussed, is not even something that is th that is someone's business. I mean, I just hope that one day um, women are seen as equal, intelligent individuals who shouldn't be, um, sh who should be talked to rather than talked about, I guess. But also I strive, I mean, What I feel is necessary is to rewrite the whole ideal of feminism, because as it is right now, the reason why so many young females are, are, are distancing themselves from feminism is because the current contemporary feminism is oppressive and is privileged and is exclusive and, and for the elite, um, and is, is, is for the white woman. Um, so the whole, um, rule book of feminism or, or, The whole ideal and definition of feminism should be rewritten to be way more inclusive than it is right now, because right now it's more so a, a white concept than it is a female concept. So I think that is like, you need to, we need to work from the core. I don't think superficial changes are going to be enough at this moment if we want to have a really strong, inclusive feminist movement in the world, which is a, a big task, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, uh, One step at a time doing this podcast is one step towards the right direction of, of spreading the, like the new ideal of, of how feminism should be. Yeah. But what can we as individuals do to create the, a better environment for tolerance and understanding around this? I think uh, reading, reading and reading and uh, respect, learn how to respect, learn how to, when you see a person, don't look. Uh, don't have that prejudgment frame in in your head. Just look at them as a person, despite whatever they are, a woman, a male, a Muslim, wearing hijab, not wearing hijab, anything. We should, as, as uh, individuals, uh, tell our friends, tell our community, try to spread the word, like uh, try to say, this is, as I mean, that's my responsibility as a Middle Eastern, like to kind of break all those pre images about Middle Eastern women in the Middle East are actually oppressed because I lived in the Middle East for 18 years. I wasn't oppressed. So I guess that's uh, our responsibility as individuals. I would say as well, more as I agree with Nadine that we need to look more into the feminist movement itself and rewriting it. But I think or I believe that the movement when it started first, it came for all women. And then the people who practice it are, mm -hmm. the, are those people who kind of changed it. So looking back into the core of it mm -hmm. and trying to reconnect with that actual pure movement where we include all women mm -hmm. rather than just having one ideal of a woman that we, we want all women to be like that. Mm -hmm. A housewife, a working mom, uh, a white woman, a dark skinned one doesn't matter we're all women <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah because it's also said that uh you know we know about the white suffragists from mm. last century but actually it was the black women that started the movement yes and mm -hmm. the whites <laughs> took over and it's like we're gonna make it ours now mm -hmm. and so i totally agree that this the core of feminism was not was not one-sided mm -hmm. no But thank you so much, Haya and Nadine. I think that is all the questions I have for today. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to come down here, have this very <laughs> insightful conversation. And, and um, yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. Any references discussed in this episode will be found in the description below. This episode was brought to you by the feminist group in Mellenfolkelit Samviega Ohus, which is a Danish NGO that works for a more just and sustainable world, collaborating with global partners worldwide as a part of the ActionAid Alliance. Here in Ohus, we have over a hundred volunteers working together to run a not-for-profit cafe, 
campaign and educate in areas ranging from feminism, climate justice, anti-discrimination, economic inequality, to queer issues and refugee rights. You can come down to Café Mellenfolk on Mailgade every day but Sunday for amazing food, drinks and events in a cozy café run by our lovely volunteers. You can also yourself become a volunteer, organize events, campaigns and even run the café. So go check out our Instagram and Facebook to find out more about the café and our campaigns. The links will be in the description. Thank you everyone for listening and until next time, bye!